Bishop Robert Barron is a theologian and pastor. He is also a best-selling author, a religion correspondent for NBC, a documentary filmmaker, a radio and podcast host, and a social media innovator. Bishop Barron earned an MA in philosophy from the Catholic University of America and a doctorate in sacred theology from the Institut Catholique de Paris. He has also served as an educator in the United States and Europe, as a member of the theological faculty, and eventually rector and president of Munzelein Seminary near Chicago. As a visiting professor at the University of Notre Dame, as a scholar in residence at the North American Pontifical College of the Vatican, and as a visiting professor at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome. In this technological age, Bishop Barron is well known beyond the halls of academia and beyond the archdiocese of Los Angeles. Many of you may listen to his Word on Fire program broadcast on Catholic radio stations. He may be a familiar face as the host of Catholicism, an award-winning documentary series about the Catholic faith that aired on hundreds of PBS stations. As a generation of digital natives, my fellow graduates may be more familiar with Bishop Barron as a result of his efforts to harness new media to reach out to the faithful and others. You may, be, you may have visited his website, also named Word on Fire, another branch of his multimedia outreach. You may be one of the 25 million viewers of his YouTube videos, or you may have seen his posts while scrolling through your feeds on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Bishop Barron has more than 50,000 Instagram followers, more than 100,000 Twitter followers, more than 115,000 YouTube subscribers, and more than 1.5 million Facebook fans. He has been described as one of the most followed Catholics in the world of social media, but I bet he has more followers than all of our social media accounts combined. When I had the chance to interview His Excellency, I asked, why social media? He replied, why not? He expressed concern that some people have stopped going to church, making it necessary for the church to do more to reach out to them in new ways. Evangelization via social media allows the church to proclaim the gospel to the world beyond the walls of churches and cathedrals. In this increasingly secular age, Bishop Barron believes that the church must be proactive and creative in spreading its message. He has a special interest in reaching out to nuns, that is N-O-N-E-S, those who claim no religious affiliation, and not nuns and U-N-S. He identifies Christian elements in the wider culture in order to grab their attention and encourage them to look at the church in ways they have not previously considered. This is one reason why many of his YouTube videos examine popular culture, music, books, videos, contemporary issues, and current events. Many people from the younger generations have shared their personal stories with Bishop Barron, stories about feeling alienated from the church but finding themselves drawn back to its embrace after watching his YouTube videos that put faith in terms they understood and found more meaningful. It is easy to critique social media's effect on modern life, but Bishop Barron demonstrates that YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter can also play an important role in sharing the church's message with everyone from the devout to the nuns. It is my honor to present the speaker of Assumption College 101st Commencement, His Excellency, the Most Reverend Robert Barron, Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Nora, thank you very much for that lovely introduction, and good morning, everybody. Bishop uh, McManus and President Cesareo, members of the Board of Trustees, honored guests, fellow graduates, first know I truly am very honored by the degree you're bestowing on me today and by this opportunity to uh, address you this morning. You know, as I stand before you about to give this commencement address, uh, my mind drifts back to a similar arena at Marquette University in the spring of 1980. 
I think it was the first commencement I ever attended, my brother's graduation. The speaker that day was a very um, holy bishop, a missionary bishop from the Philippines. And he started to give the commencement address, and I think everybody was pretty interested as he started. Forty-five minutes into his address, he paused and said, I could go on and on, <laughs> at which point the graduates and their parents all said no. <laughs> so as a cautionary tale as I begin this uh, commencement address, trust me, I will not uh, speak very long. First, a word of very sincere congratulation to my fellow graduates of the class of 2018. Really proud of what you guys have accomplished over these years, and I am delighted to be counted in your number today as a fellow graduate. I also want to express my personal gratitude to all the parents, and again, especially the mothers on this Mother's Day. Uh, you've made a lot of sacrifices, I know that. And you must feel an extraordinary sense of pride today, as well as a bit of relief, I bet. You know, about five years ago, I think it was, I read an interview with the actor Don Johnson. Now, you guys don't know Don Johnson, but your parents do, right? Because Don Johnson in the 1980s was one of the coolest people on the planet. His handsome face was on the cover of every magazine. His television show, Miami Vice, was number one in the country. His sartorial choices set the tone for men's fashions all over the world. If there was, at that time, a candidate for the title of He's Got It All, it would have been Don Johnson. Well, in the interview, he recalled the party that took place at his Florida estate in the mid-80s, when he was at the height of his powers. Not one, not two, but three of his yachts were moored in his private bay, and glitterati were cavorting everywhere. Johnson was looking out at the proceedings from a balcony on the upper story of his home, and, he said, it occurred to him at that moment that all of his dreams had come true. He was wealthy beyond his wildest hopes. He was one of the most famous men in the world. The most beautiful people wanted to be with him. He was a major cultural influence. Practically any sensual pleasure was available to him. However, he recalled, his very next thought was, then why am I so blank miserable? Well, people trained at an Augustinian institution know the answer to that question, don't they? On the very first page of his confessions, Augustine penned one of the wisest lines in the history of Christian spirituality. He said, pithily enough, Lord, you have made us for yourself, and therefore our heart is restless until it rests in you. You know, this is both our glory and our burden, isn't it? A dog runs around at the beach, gets enough to eat, enjoys the affection of his master, and he's perfectly happy. But we human beings can experience all the goods the world has to offer. Wealth, pleasure, honor, power, and still feel unsatisfied, restless. It's simply because we were made for more than that. And as C.S. Lewis points out, it's often precisely at the best moments of life, not the worst, that we become most aware of this holy longing. This goes a long way to explaining what Don Johnson felt that night. All my dreams have come true, and yet I'm miserable. And see, let me address the graduates directly. When we forget this elemental truth, we fall almost automatically into some form of addiction. Trying, for example, to satisfy the deepest longing of your heart with wealth, you'll get a kind of buzz when you meet your first financial goal, but the buzz will wear off. Then you'll strive and strive, endeavoring to acquire more wealth, 
And when you reach your next financial goal, the buzz might return, but as any addict will tell you, it will wear off faster this time. Now you panic, and your striving becomes frantic and eventually self-destructive as your whole life commences to center around the accumulation of riches. The same dynamic obtains in regard to all other worldly goods. If you have any doubts about the addictive quality of sensual pleasure, take a good look at the prevalence of pornography in our culture. Any doubts about the addictive quality of power, look to far too many of our politicians. Any doubts about the addictive quality of honor, look at the compromised lives of so many of our entertainers and pop stars. You know, St. Augustine himself confessed to a painful and rather embarrassing addiction to honor. He tells a story of being carried on a litter through the streets of Milan on his way to deliver a speech that he had composed in praise of the emperor. Ambitious throughout his youth to achieve great distinction in the public arena, he was feeling in that journey a rush of pride and self-satisfaction. He then spied a drunken man, poorly dressed, unshaven, filthy, mumbling to himself. And Augustine looked down at him with a mixture of contempt and condescension. But then something devastating occurred to him. He thought, tomorrow that man will be sober, but I will still be drunk on ambition. In other words, the great Augustine, confidant of the emperor, was as much an addict as the vagrant. So, the satisfaction of the restless heart is in God alone. That's easy enough to say, but what does it mean exactly? What does it look like on the ground? Well, St. John summed up Christianity in the simple declaration that God is love. Every religion will say that God loves or that love is one of God's attributes, but only Christianity claims that love is God's very nature. What God is straight through. So if this is true, then filling ourselves with God means filling ourselves with love. And here's where things get rather paradoxical. For love is not a feeling or a sentiment. Rather, love is an act of the will. It is to desire the good of the other. It's wanting what's best for somebody else and then doing something about it. Therefore, to love is to give oneself away, to empty oneself for the sake of one's neighbor. And so here's the formula, everybody. Here's the key to happiness. Throw away all the self-help books. This is it from the standpoint of the Christian tradition. To be filled with God, that's what the heart wants, is to be emptied out. To have God in you is equivalent to making your life a gift. If you want joy, that's the path. The great Mother Teresa of Calcutta caught everything I've been saying so far with an admirable economy of expression. And if you forget everything I've said in this talk, please remember this. This is the summation of it. She said, don't worry about doing great things. Do little things with great love. Now, I know that sounds a bit like a Hallmark card platitude, but when rightly understood, it's bedrock spiritual truth that you can live by. See, great things in the eyes of the world usually involve making money or wielding power or being honored, but great things in the eyes of God are acts of love, however simple and however hidden. It is in the latter, graduates, and not the former, that you will find what your hungry heart is looking for. Now, am I saying you should simply 
let go of the goods of this world, retire to a monastery, and then you'll find happiness. By no means. There isn't the slightest thing wrong with money, power, pleasure, and professional accomplishment. Listen, as long as you don't make them the center of your lives, as long as you don't seek the joy of your soul in them. As again, the great Augustine said in one of his more memorable phrases, Dilige et fac quod vis. Love, and then do whatever you want. In other words, if love, if willing the good of the other is at the center of your concerns, off you go. Participate in business, law, finance, education, entrepreneurship, politics, sports, communication, the raising of a family, entertainment. Off you go, provided that all these endeavors are expressions of love. See, and then, everybody, if you find wealth, you will know what to do with it. Then, if you're honored, it'll be for the right reasons. Then, if you acquire power, you will use it to enhance the lives of others. Hans Urs von Balthasar, who was a favorite theologian of the last three popes, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and Pope Francis, famously distinguished between what he called the ego drama and the theo drama. What's the ego drama? Well, that's the play in which you're the producer, you're the director, you're the writer, and above all, you're the star. Being a success in this production is what concerns most people most of the time. But the theodrama is the play which God is producing. God is writing. God is directing. You've got a role in it to be sure. We all do. That's why we're here. But it might be a bit part, at least in the eyes of the world. But who cares? Joseph Campbell once said, the greatest tragedy is to have climbed the ladder of success only to find it was up against the wrong wall. I'm here to tell you, the smallest part in the theodrama will produce more joy in you than a starring role in the ego drama. And so, fellow graduates, your hearts are restless until they rest in God. Can I urge you today, follow that holy longing all the way. Consistently choose the theodrama over the ego drama. Love, and then do whatever you want. God bless you all today. Thanks.